Hi, welcome to Entitled to Life, a podcast about healthcare activism, policy, and politics. I am your host, Paul Gibbs. My co-host, Katie Drake, is out tonight. She lost her voice, which is less than ideal for uh, an Odd Hill podcast. But I am, I always say I'm excited for this episode, but this may be the most excited I've been for an episode because I think it's a very important subject right now, which is Biden versus Trump on health care. Well, talking about the differences between the two candidates' approaches to health care and their plans for what they plan to do with health care in a first term for Biden or a second term for Trump. And our guest tonight is somebody that I'm really excited to have on the show. We have Charles Gabba. He is a health care analyst and advocate and blogger and just does all sorts of things for health care policy and activism in this country. He is, he's a really incredible voice for healthcare on social media and blogs and other venues. And I'm just, for, the, for those of us who are healthcare policy geeks, this is, this is almost like having one of the Beatles on, on, on the show. <laughs> if, if Andy Slavitt is John Lennon, Charles Gabba is Paul McCartney. That's, that's what this means to somebody like me. So Thank you so much for joining us for the show tonight. Oh, th thank you for having me. I, I always figured I'd be more like Ringo, but that's, you know, I'll take Well, that. you know, Ringo <laughs> was a highly underrated Beatle. I've come to appreciate him more and more over the years. He was the funny one. Come on. It's, right. Um, <laughs> no, th thank you. Thank you. So, Trump versus Biden on health care. Um, looking at their different plans, um, you know, this is, I, I make clear all the time, this is, I'm not a journalist. This is an activism and advocacy podcast. I don't pretend to be, I don't pretend I'm not taking a side here and I'm definitely with Biden on this. Um, in fact, I would say in, in pretty simple terms, in, in, in the simplest terms, the difference between Biden and Trump's plans on healthcare is that Biden has one. Um, <laughs> Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, uh, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, I mean, when it comes to Trump, that there's really, there's, I'd say there's really two plans, and I'm, I'm using air quotes as people can't see that, but um, one of them would be his quote unquote plan, and then the other would be, you know, sort of the generic uh, Republican Party quote unquote plan. Neither one is really a plan, but the, the, his is just com complete gibberish. Um, Republicans' generic plan is, as far as I can tell, is basically uh, reverse as much, you know, strip away the ACA and let the chips fall where they may. And, uh, you know, they've also been hacking away at Medicare and Medicaid for yeah. many years before. So that's their plan. And, you know, that that is incredibly personal to me, because as I've talked about on the show before, uh, I had a kidney transplant 11 years ago, Medicare and Medicaid are how I got that. That's why I became a healthcare activist is because I wouldn't be here today with that, uh, w without that. So my, I'm all about getting other people the access that kept me alive. And, you know, with, th thank you for making that really important distinction between what Trump wants to do and the standard Republican approach, because they're often different things. And I'm not so sure they're always working together on them, except on the idea of getting rid of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention is, you know, there's, there's so much talk about the protections for pre-existing conditions. We have Trump just mm -hmm. this week, he's been saying for quite some time that he would not, that he'd protect pre-existing conditions, but now he's gone so far as to say that Biden would try to take them away. I think that may be the most ridiculous statement Trump has made, and I don't say that lightly. Um, <laughs> those, those protections for pre-existing conditions are, I mean, I have a transplanted kidney, that's one heck of a pre-existing condition, and I, mm -hmm. uh, in the summer of 2019, I actually, testified to the House Oversight Com Committee um, about protecting those pre-existing conditions. And Jim Jordan, who was the ranking member of the committee, um, very, in my opinion, very rudely told the chair 
the late Elijah Cummings that it was a lie that Republicans wanted to get rid of pre-existing conditions. And you know what I told him, what I said that at the time, because I spoke shortly after that, is that they say that, but the plans that they have put forth in the past do not protect pre-existing conditions. They do things like expensive and unstable high-risk pools. That so, um, would you agree that that's a that's a difference between the two approaches? We keep hearing that that both want to protect pre-existing conditions, or that just the Republicans do. But is there anything to back up the idea that they're trying to protect pre-existing conditions? Um, well, the thing that I think people have to understand, and I, I, I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure um, how like how savvy you know your your are uh, you know about the details of the ACA or, or the sort of thing. I, so I'm going. I apologize if I'm assuming that they don't know stuff that they do already. Um, but the thing about uh, the pre-existing condition protections is that you have to be careful because there's really several parts to that. Um, and uh, I, I'm one of the things I'm known for is, is the, the three-legged stool. That's sort of the model of the Affordable Care Act. You know, the idea is if you look at it, if you pretend that it's a, a three-legged stool and you know, one of those legs, uh, which I call, I call the blue leg, which is the uh, insurance carrier requirements. You know, this is the, the regulations that they're required to pr provide. That's you know, the pre-existing condition protections for the most part. And the thing is that that leg actually consists of about a half dozen sort of sections. And the three most important sections are guaranteed issue, uh, community rating, and essential health benefits. And those three things combined make up the bulk of when people talk about protection, you know, protecting pre, uh, coverage of pre-existing conditions, they're really talking about all three of those. And what those are is you know, guaranteed issue simply means insurance carriers have to sell the policies to everyone, that they are not allowed to uh, discriminate or, you know, or say, sorry, we're not going to sell it to you, um, you know, because you have medical conditions, you know, because of your, your uh, history uh, you know, of medical problems, health problems, what have you. Um, and that's the part that Republicans sort of tend to sort of stop at. The problem is that there's the other two things, which is community rating, which means that not only do they have to sell policies to everyone, they cannot charge more because you have a pre-existing condition or because of your medical history or because, uh, you know, because of your gender. You know, they used to sell, they used to charge women more. Um, they can't charge more because of your job, you know, what type of um, profession you have or your hobbies or you know a variety of, of different things about you uh, they used to be able to discriminate on pricing so okay they not only do they have to sell it to you but they also have to sell you know the same price to everyone within certain guidelines and then the third part is essential health benefits and that basically just means that the policies that are ACA compliant have to cover the sorts of services that you would expect a major medical health care you know, policy to cover. So, you know, surgery, hospitalization, uh, you know, prescription drugs, maternity care, uh, you know, the, the, basically the stuff that you, the whole point of buying the policy. And again, the problem is before the ACA, a lot of times they would sell policies that basically wouldn't cover practically anything. So, or, the, or what they might do is, if you had a pre-existing condition, they would say, well, we're going to include an exclusion for you. You know, you come to them and you, they think you might have cancer and they'll say, well, we're going to take this policy and we're going to scratch off the whole cancer section. So we'll cover you. For, if you break your arm, we'll cover you, but not, you know, for your chemotherapy and so on. So, so those three things make, and there's some other parts as well, but those are sort of the big three. And, um, I know um, Cory Gardner, for example, a Republican senator from uh, Colorado, he's been making, he's, he has a new ad out where he's talking about how he, he authored the bill that would protect pre-existing condition coverage no matter, you know, no matter what. Now he says this at the same time that of course he supports tearing down the ACA and supports this lawsuit to uh, strike it down, right. um, which would thus make it necessary to, you know, for his bill to suddenly actually come to effect. But his bill, all it does, it's like a one sentence bill. All it does literally is an issue and it does nothing else. It doesn't, it doesn't cover like 98% of the Affordable Care Act. It does not replace just that one little snippet. So, so that's, yeah, that's, that's what they're usually talking about is just that first little, little chunk. Thank you. That's, I, that is a great explanation. I, 
I appreciate you giving us that more detailed insight into what these protections mean because it's easy to get confused in all of the in all of the talk, all of the rhetoric, and and in all of the insurance language. And you know, even just since Trump came into office, these these short term plans, the what are colloquially referred to as Trump care plans are 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 dispensing with a lot with important aspects of they're getting away with not being ACA compliant and people are trying to sell these mm -hmm. as if they're the same quality of insurance and they're not and that really concerns me in the in the summer of 2017 when I was really getting into a panic about repeal of the ACA I had someone try to contact me and saying mm -hmm. I, I I have a solution I represent one of these Christian health plans and he was was going on about right. it said now it doesn't protect pre-existing conditions for the but just just for the first two years and i said okay i have thousands of dollars a month in in prescriptions i have to take to keep my my transplanted kidney alive i won't last the first two months on your plan and that <laughs> that's what what really concerns me about all of that so not all promises to to protect pre-existing conditions are equal i guess is what I hope people will understand about this, that, that nothing, no other plan has ever been put out there which protects pre-existing conditions to the degree that the ACA does. Yeah, and that's, I mean, you know, from a pure um, sort of a capitalist, you know, perspective, it actually makes sense. You know, you know they say these short-term plans, which, uh, you know, the Trump administration has been trying to push, you know, so very hard, uh, and other, I, I actually, I, 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 I sort of grouped together all of these uh, non-ACA compliant plans because there's about a half dozen different types. You know, there's the short-term plans, there's the uh, the sharing ministry plans, which is what you were just describing. Uh, they're not always Christian. They're usually called Christian, but they, you know, they're usually some sort of religious uh, yeah. group behind it. But, uh, they're called sharing ministry plans. There's farm bureau plans. There's about, there's several different types. But all of these, what they share is that they are not ACA compliant. And um, what these policies, you know, have in common is, well, they cost a lot less in, you know, in, in official premiums and such. That is true. But there's a reason for that. The reason is because usually, usually they're crap. Or, or, to be fair, some of them are not necessarily bad plans if you can get approved for them. Because the problem is that they are still allowed. You know they are still allowed to discriminate against you, so they can just not sell it to you at all. They can charge you more. They can have the exclusions and so forth. That's why they're so much cheaper because they, you know, they can cherry pick their uh, their their enrollees. And um, the problem, the the ACA did not ban these. What it did do was it put restrictions on them. Number one, and it also uh, at the time you had the individual mandate penalty, right, for for the ACA. Right. It said that that you have to have ACA compliant coverage, or if you don't, that there would be a financial, you know, it's, it's an extra tax, is what it was defined as. Right. There would be this extra tax they have to pay, and the reason for that extra tax, by the way, is twofold: one, to encourage you to sign up for you know an ACA plan, right. but to, number two, number two, is because the increase in the premiums for everyone else from you not being part of that risk pool is partially paid for by the subsidies and part of the payment, the coverage of the subsidy, basically your, your penalty is going to pay for the increase in premiums caused by you, the, you know, a healthy person uh, not signing up for one of those plans, you know? Right. So, uh, so yeah, it's not, there's no real, um, you know, magic to it is basically if you, you know, it's like it's like selling a car. You know, you can if, if you if you remove the tires and the engine, <laughs> you know, and the steering wheel, you can probably sell it for a lot less. You know. Yeah. So so yeah, they're they're less expensive because they don't do a whole lot. Uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, I'm a filmmaker and I was have been looking at potentially buying a new camera and I came across a nice um, a nice one on the Facebook mar marketplace today that after going through all of his features in small letters at the bottom, it said, no lens. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was it was nicely inexpensive for its type of camera because it's missing the feature that it most needs 
to be effective. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at with some of these plans, I think. Uh, so, so kind of touched on that about, I mean, that's really about all Trump has told us about his plan is he'll protect pre-existing conditions without giving us specific information on how, and that it's going to be wonderful healthcare that's better than the ACA. He's been saying that for five or six years, including his campaign, but he's not gotten into more detail on that. So let's talk a little bit more about the specifics of, of what Biden wants to do beyond, beyond continuing protections for pre-existing conditions. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about, tell me a little bit about what he plans to do to make coverage available to more people? Sure. Um, and so uh, Biden's uh, proposal, it actually, it's actually fairly similar um, to several of the other candidates you know, during the primaries and several of the other Democratic candidates. Um, you know, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Amy Klobuchar, I, I believe uh, Cory Booker. Yes. Um, several of the, you know, sort of the, the, the they were considered the, the moderate wing, uh, although, you know, they're actually, even the, even the most moderate uh, Dems up there were actually a lot more progressive than Democrats were, you know, a decade ago. So right. it, it's been moved, the Overton window has definitely moved, been moved to the left. Um, it's really a combination of about three or four major parts. You know, there's a lot to it, but um, what I call it is uh, ACA 2.0 plus a public option, right? Um, a lot of people tend to lump the two together. I, in my head, I sort of separate the two because, um, for example, the House Democrats, they actually passed a bill back in July. Uh, it didn't go anywhere in the Senate, of course, but they actually basically passed ACA 2.0. Uh, this July, uh, House Bill 1425. Um, and a lot of those similar features are included in Biden's plan. Um, but so what his plan does is that the first thing is sort of the ACA 2.0 part is it, it does three main things. It repairs, it protects, and it strengthens. The repairing basically means that it fixes a lot of the, uh, pre the a lot of the damage that's been done to the ACA. Um, by the Trump administration through basically reversing a lot of his executive orders and such. Um, but it also fixes some stuff that was sort of done through wear and tear, shall we say, over the years since the law was passed in 2010. Um, it protects in that it sort of it codifies and locks in a lot of the protections that weren't intrinsically part of the ACA, but were protected by President Obama through executive orders and such but they were never codified, you know? And so the second Trump came in, he was able to, you know, pluck them out. Right. But the main thing, the sort of the, 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 the sexy part, if you will, is the strengthening. And that you said, the first, number one, it uh, kills the subsidy cliff. And what I mean by that is um, for the ACA, if you buy an individual market policy on the exchange at healthcare.gov or one of the state exchanges, you are all financial subsidies on a sliding income scale up to a certain income threshold. So it starts at basically the poverty level and then it rises up to 400%. If you make four times the poverty level, uh, the federal poverty level, and you receive subsidies and there's a formula involved, but it's on a sliding scale. So, you know, the, if you if you were at the lower end, then you get very heavy subsidies and you pay almost nothing. If you're at the upper end, then you have fairly nominal subsidies. But the problem is that it cuts off at 400%. So if you make even $1 more than that, you have to pay full price. Now, if you're young, you know, uh, the, 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 if, the premium, if the premium is, if you're younger, then it's gonna be less expensive anyway. So it may not make that big of a difference if you're say 25 to 30 years old and you earn a little bit over that, you know, that 400% cap. Um, you know, you might have only been getting like 10 bucks a month anyway in subsidies. Right. But if you're older or if you're family or, you know, depending on where you live, um, the full price premiums, like if you're 64 years old, <laughs> you know, just one year out of Medicare, at full price, those premiums can be ridiculously high at, you know, at full price. And it can cost like 30, 40% of your, you know, of your, your income. It's, it's basically completely unaffordable. So the first thing that Biden's plan does is that subsidy cliff and it makes it um, so that the subsidies still drop off, but it's more of a gradual drop off. 
And that can mean a dramatic, make a dramatic difference for people who are say 40 or 40 or older, say between 40 and 65, 64, give or take. It can save you up to literally tens of thousands of dollars per year. Um, it can cut your premiums down by like 70, 80, 90% just by, just by removing that clip, not like without even making any other changes. Right. That alone would make uh, the policies dramatically more affordable for millions of people. The second thing it does is it beefs up that formula, you know, the, the underlying formula for those who receive subsidies. It basically just makes it much more generous so that instead of paying, you know, say 2% of your income at the lower end, you're, you might be paying half a percent. Instead of, and then at the upper end, instead of cutting off like 9.8%, uh, it cuts it off at 8.5%. And that may not sound like much, but again, that could be many thousands of dollars depending right. on you know, depending on your your household. Um, and I've been calling for these two things to be done for years. Right. Uh, basically, beef up the formula and kill the cliff. Those two things alone dramatically strengthen the ACA. It also and it, it does a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, it uh, um, he includes a provision that would deal with the uh, Medicaid expansion problem in the dozen or so states that have not, that still refuse to expand yes. Medicaid. The, the, the original, the ACA originally um, was designed so that, the, the idea was that all, it was that all 50 states, you know, would be required to right. expand Medicaid. There was a Supreme Court hearing, a uh, decision in 2012, which said that no, it has to be, it has to be optional. You know, it has to be up to the states. About half the states, said sure and the other half said no and of course the ones that said no were mostly republican states the red states right. over time over time more and more of those states have come around some some have grudgingly agreed to uh more recently about four or five uh deep red states nebraska utah um idaho yeah have, I, have passed. I was a i was a big part of that campaign in utah for seven years until we finally passed it in the 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 ballot initiative and yes there there has been some incredibly frustrating stubborn refusal to to expand that and i've um i i went to florida and texas florida and rather and north carolina two states that still haven't expanded medicaid to make documentaries there showing the need for it and it just it's really upsetting to think of some of these places that are going through the pandemic without the Medicaid expansion. So, right. so I'll let you finish what you're saying, but that's you know, sure. really difficult for me personally, knowing that some of these people still don't have it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so basically the idea is um, that originally, for example, originally uh, to entice the states to do so, the ACA would cover that the federal government would cover 100% of the cost for the first three years. And then after that, it would gradually drop off to the point where the states would, it would still, the, the, the federal government still covers 90%, but the states um, starting, I think last year, that they cover 10% and that's where it stops. Yeah. So the states have to cover 10% of the cost, the feds cover 90%. It's still the, the greatest deal that a state will ever get. Absolutely. It's an incredibly generous deal, but you know, some states still wouldn't do it, uh, whether for political, you know, obviously political reasons or whatever, but also also for budgetary reasons, because 10% of, you know, you could still talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in the state right. budget. Uh, so Biden's plan includes a, um, a provision that uh, basically he's going to be, he wants to have to add this public option right. to the exchanges. And the, there's a provision in his plan that would allow the states that didn't have not expanded Medicaid, that 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 population that would otherwise be on Medicaid would be allowed into the public option at zero premium. So basically, they would enroll in the public option plan, but they, it wouldn't cost them a dime. It wouldn't be a buy-in because they would, you know, the cost for their premiums would be covered. It's not quite as good as uh, Medicaid, maybe, but. You know, it would still be a hell of a lot better than not having anything. So that's sort of the workaround that he's come up with. Um, I don't know all the details of it, but that's my understanding of, of what he has in mind. Um, and so th th those are, that's another big chunk of it. Um, 
the third, uh, the, the second sort of big part would be, you know, as I said, the public option um, right. that would be added to, uh, that would be added to the exchange. Um, so you'd still have the ACA exchanges, healthcare.gov, you still have all these private plans, but you'd also have, you know, so you have, instead of having four options, you'd have a fifth option. And the fifth option right. would be the public, uh, public one. Um, and it would be, you know, priced competitively and, you know, ho hopefully priced le less, you know, less expensively and with a better network and so forth. Um, but that's the idea behind that. Um, and that hopefully that would, you know, the idea is that that would drive, uh, drive down prices because of competition. It would be especially important in uh, what are called dry counties or, or basically areas where there's, you know, a monopoly insurer that gets to set the prices whatever they want because they're the only game in town. Um, so this would force them, you know, keep them in check and so forth. And then the third, uh, third major part of it is basically uh, it takes up the uh, lower prescription drugs now bill HR3, which was also passed by the House uh, last year, actually, um, which would allow, which would finally allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices, which has been, you know, one of the holy grails. <laughs> Yes. of uh, progressive healthcare uh, uh, goals for many years now. Um, and so, yeah, would allow uh, Medicare to negotiate pricing, which, which would, and you know, the CBO has done analysis and a bunch of think tanks have done, would save hundreds of billions of dollars per year on prescription costs. And so the savings from that would not only lower the prices, but it would also help to pay for uh, you know, like the public option and, and uh, subsidy expansion and such. So this would be a huge step forward in healthcare access to, if if not quite, if this is not quite universal healthcare, it's a huge step in that direction. And that's a absolutely, uh, and that's something that. There's, there's been controversy about healthcare, like you said, there were Biden and Buttigieg and people who've promoted options like this one have been referred to as the moderates. And there has been some, something of a, a schism between the moderate and progressive wings of the Democratic Party from those who are, are intent on a Medicare for all single payer approach. Now, I'm not going to, by no means do I have any intention of denigrating a single payer or Medicare for all approach. But what I have a hard time with is, is people who take it to kind of an all or nothing extreme where mm -hmm. it's, it's Medicare for all or it's nothing. For, for people like me, like I said, it costs me, it, without insurance, it would cost me as much per month to get the medications that keep my transplanted kidney alive, to keep my body from rejecting it. Those would cost as much per month as my mortgage payment. For me, there is a huge difference between having the, even the ACAs that exist now, much less this ACA 2.0 with a public option, and having nothing. Um, I, I think acting as if this is doing nothing is, is ridiculous. It's, this is a huge step forward that would benefit people. It's benefit millions and millions of people. It's, it's what we have on the table now, and it is very, very much worth supporting. I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> uh, so um, if, if there's anything people get from, from listening to this, this podcast today, I hope it's that if you're not so excited about, about Biden's plan because it's, not, because it's not Medicare for all, Please understand that it is still a huge step forward. Let's not take an attitude that we'd rather have nothing than settle for less. Many of us literally can't live with that. Yeah, and I'd also add, and, and again, there's there's a whole bunch more to this plan as well. But you know, it would take it would take hours to go into all the details. Right. But um, one other thing that I should note is that um, this is actually a recent addition to his plan. His plan is mostly the same as it was last summer, but. Uh, this past spring, he added uh, one more interesting twist to it, which is um, 
which is that he is an also he's also calling for lowering the age of Medicare of Medicare to, from 60, 65 down to 60. Now, again, that may not sound like much five years, but that's I think that's a good 30, 40 million people, something like that. And um, and and I, I'm a little I'm a little confused because this would be in addition to the public option. And but it's it sounds to me like it would basically serve the same, you know, like you'd have the public option, but you'd also have, you know, for 60 to 64, you'd also have this, you know, Medicare buy in. So I'm not sure exactly how that would work. But I suspect that that was the influence of I don't know this, but I suspect that that would be the influence of those that basically, you know, after you know, Biden became the, the presumptive nominee, he and Bernie started working together. And so he said, Okay, I'll tell you what, you know, let, let's at least sort of, you know, sort of throw you a bone, lower, you know, Medicare and Medicare buy-in uh, you know, down to 60. I don't know. I mean, it might just be a semantic distinction between that and the public op option. I don't know. But, um, but it's an interesting additional thing that he threw in there. Uh, is. This proposal. It may be, I mean, may, maybe for all I know, that may be like the fallback. Larger public option doesn't make it through the, you know, the sausage grinder that, okay, you know, knock, knock that down by five years. I don't know. Right. And, and, you know, that's, that's an important point you bring up of not making it through. The, the public option was at one point part of the original ACA. It didn't make it through, through into the version that passed. And, and that's concerned that there, could be changes between what's being proposed now and what makes it through, but I I get some criticism for saying this because people think it's defeatist. But I think anybody that knows me and knows what I've tried to do for for healthcare activism for the past seven years knows that that I'm that nobody's a more firm believer in healthcare for all than everybody, and nobody is willing to put in more than I, I am, but I believe that idealism has to be tempered with a certain degree of realism. And I truly don't believe that Medicare for All, a version of single payer, would make it through Congress, even if Democrats retake the Senate. We're not talking about any possibility, and there never was any possibility of creating such a huge Democratic supermajority that it wouldn't matter if some of the more moderate Democrats were a little unsure about this. We, it's, it's, it's important what can pass and what can't. Well, yeah, and it's, see, now we're getting into an interesting, this is, you know, this is not healthcare specific. This is just sort of, you know, for any sort of policy uh, of progress, there's sort of a philosophical, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the Overton window before, right? And right. Um, you know, the progress, sort of the the med the, the purest mindsets for the Medicare for all or nothing. The idea, of course, and I understand this, is you know, you don't start negotiating on the fifty yard lot, right? You know, you, right. you start in the end zone and you and then you you know you might negotiate down to the seventy five or you know whatever whatever metaphor you use. And that's true. I agree. You don't want to you don't want to give away everything before you start. I agree with that. However. You do at least have to start out inside the stadium. <laughs> yes. And and the bottom line is that that a when you say Medicare for all, it's also important to, for people to understand that there's the fr there's the brand. Um, a, a friend of mine, um, um, uh, Sean. Oh God, I can't for, I forget his last name. I apologize. Um, he's he's actually a broadcaster himself. Um, he keeps saying, and I love the way he puts it, there's Medicare for all and, and there's Medicare for all the bill, right? Right. Um, and the brand, and that's why there's been so much confusion and, and misinterpretation. When you talk about Medicare for all, the bill, people are usually, in the last few years, they're usually referring to a specific bill sponsored by Bernie Sanders in the Senate or a very, very, very similar specific bill uh, in the House, uh, who's a, um, a representative, uh, uh, Jayapal, um, is, is the primary sponsor. And that's the one that has like a hundred and some odd, you know, co-sponsors in the House. They're very, very similar. That's what usually people are thinking of. And those bills are like 99.9% .9 quote unquote pure single payer, right? right. Where, where almost a hundred percent 
of everything under the sun, every medical or healthcare service or, or drug or you know, whatever you could possibly imagine would be included. All of it would be paid for by the federal government with federal dollars and it would cover absolutely everyone, you know, and, you know including uh, uh, undocumented immigrants and, you know, and so on and so forth from cradle to grave, you know, from, from pregnancy and, and from birth all the way up until the day you die, uh, at, you know, a hundred or more. That's, you know, and a hundred percent kind of comprehensive, a hundred percent, you know, uh, actuarial value covering everything, zero copay, zero deductible, zero premium of any sort, right? No, no cost sharing or whatever of any sort. Right. And there's, I think there's like a cap of like $200 for, for generic drugs or something like that. Right? But that's it. Um, that's where they're starting. That's the starting line that they're going with. And the problem is that when you ask more, do you, and they say, oh, there's all these polls that show Medicare for all, you know, has the majority support. Well, it does, and, but then you start letting them know, oh, by the way, we're talking about Medicare for all where, you know, yes, you're, you're, yes, taxes would for a lot of people because you got to pay for it. Right. Um, now, your premiums and deductibles and such would be eliminated. So, you know, right. for a lot of people, it would cancel itself out or you'd save more. But the point is, when you, there's also been polls that have shown when you ask what people think the term Medicare for all means, a big chunk, it's, I don't think it's a majority, but it's a large chunk of the population thinks that it means Medicare for all who want it. Right. And, uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg talked about this a lot, you know, that, that in, in, during the primaries, that when you hear for all, people think that it means if, you know, if you want it, if you don't, you know, if you don't want it, you don't have to have it if you want it. And that's where the whole, you know, elimination of, of uh, private, you know, employer coverage comes in and the controversy over that. And the other part of Medicare for all that people can get confused about is the Medicare part, because right. a lot of them think that they're talking about the current Medicare, which does have premiums, does have copays, yes. does have deductibles, and does have limitations on what's covered, you know, and, and for how long and so forth. And um, so they're talking about, so they're not talking about Medicare as it exists now. It's this whole other th program which happens to have the same name. <laughs> right. Which caused a lot of confusion. <laughs> that that left me very so. conf confused about the program when when that term Medicare for all was first being thrown around because you know I I had Medicare for my kidney transplant because that is a younger person. I was only 34 at the time, but a younger person can get Medicare in end stage kidney failure. And I thought there are limitations to what I'm what my Medicare covers. It's, this is not like all everything. So yeah, it's taken me some time to try to figure out the, the semantics of all of that. But we're getting close to being out of time here. And again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to ask you if you could Perfect. just kind of boil down to a simple pitch of why people should support throwing out all of the many other reasons why people should support Biden over Trump at the moment, boiling it down to just the issue of health care. What's the simplest pitch you can make of why people should choose Biden over Trump for health care? Health care is very expensive. And, and yes, there are things you can do to, you know, to, to reduce the cost and, and so forth. But even if you do that, it still can be very expensive, especially for people with complicated, you know, um, situations, you know, with, with cancer, with diabetes, with any number of expensive um, healthcare situations. And because it's very expensive, that means somebody that it has to be paid for. And if you are going to call for every, if you believe that everyone deserves to have quality healthcare coverage, at a price they can afford, and I mean truly afford, right. you know, not, not some official government definition, but really, really, able. that means that it's going to have to be paid for, and a lot of those people cannot afford it themselves. Therefore, other people are going to have to pay for it. That is of insurance, by the way, uh, people should keep in mind, shared risk. Yes. The Biden, you know, the Biden and the Democratic mindset is that that health care is a share, should be a shared responsibility, that it should be a human right. 
the way that we get there, we argue about you know, what the best way to get there is, but we all believe on the Democratic side of the aisle that everyone should receive, should, should be able to have health care coverage uh, that they can, you know, at an affordable price. The Republican mindset in general and the Trump administration in particular is that you should be, if, if you can afford it, good for you. If you can't, too bad. You know, uh, there was a Democratic uh, congressman, he's no longer in office, but uh, uh, his name was Alan Grayson uh, a while back, um, who he famously, he had a, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a um, an easel, you know, with a poster board, and he presented what he called the Republican health care plan. And it was their alternative to the Affordable Care Act. And, and basically what it said was the Republican health care plan, don't get sick. Yeah. But if you do get sick, die quickly. <laughs> no, because that way, if, if, you, if, if it's good, that way it won't be that expensive because, you know, you'll die so quickly. So you won't have to have all those expensive drugs and, you know, chemotherapy and what have you. And, you know, of course it was uh, hyperbole and all over the top, but really that's kind of what it boils down to. Yes. Is you either, you either believe that everybody deserves to have decent healthcare coverage at an affordable price, or you don't. Uh, Democrats do believe that. Joe Biden does believe that. Bernie Sanders obviously does believe that. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, so Kamala Harris and so forth. Um, Trump basically just says whatever he says, and none of it really means much of anything. <laughs> so hopefully that was wasn't too complicated. <laughs> no, I think that what it's you know I was putting on the spot something diff difficult there. It's not something that can be boiled down to one sentence, and I think that's a good thing. I think we try way too hard, too often in politics today to to put things on a bumper sticker and good policy doesn't fit our box sticker. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that people will listen to this and, and come to have a better understanding of what, what the difference between the two candidates is on this issue, what the nuances of the Biden approach to healthcare are. As we finish up, I'm just gonna throw in a quick plug to our audience. Um, my, my dramatic short film about Medicaid expansion, Living in the Gap, will be playing starting on, well, starting actually tonight, September 17th, at the Morehouse College Human Rights Film Festival online, and we'll start playing next week online on the 24th of September at the International Social Change Film Festival, also known as Change Fest. So if you have a chance to, to check those out, I think, I think the second festival is cheaper to watch online than the first one. But if you can, I, I'd love to have people seeing the film because that's what I made it for. Um, Charles, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.